Hi, and welcome to The Room Live. Um, we're filming here in uh, Hollywood, Los Angeles, and I'm really excited today to have uh, Harry Dent. Um, he's an economist, and he's written a book called The Great Depression Ahead. And um, Harry, I just want to read here, is, um, Harry is a renowned economist and forecaster. When no one else, he successfully predicted the 1990 collapse of the Japanese market, the extraordinary boom of the 90s and the 2000s, the devastating global recession that began in 2008, and you're obviously the author of The Great Depression Ahead. Please welcome Harry Dent. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. 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 So, um, my understanding is that th this this book here, The Great Depression Ahead, is not your. This is your latest book, but you have quite a few others out. Yeah, we came out with a hardback version of this in late 2008, and now this is the paperback version, which we have a lot of revisions, yep. uh, particularly for the scenario in the next uh, couple of years and, and the whole global outlook, right. which we totally rewrote those three chapters. And I always tell people it's very funny for me because for 20 years we've been bullish. Yeah. Uh, late 80s, early 90s, everybody thought the United States was going down and the world had peaked and Japan was going to take it. We said, no, no, great. we're going to see the greatest boom in history in the Western countries like the United States and Europe and Australia. And Japan is going to see a 12 to 14 year downturn. People are like, well, what are you smoking? It, it, this doesn't make any sense. And what well, we tell people. What was it like at that time to be going out there and actually reporting that information and having people say to you, what are you smoking? You're crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, it was a little easier than now because people would rather hear a bullish forecast. But, right. but yeah, it's it just like we had done our research. Yep. Uh, we tracked what we've done back for decades. Uh, I've studied every cycle in history and, and, and what we noted, what we learned in, in modern times, it's new generations just going up a predictable family cycle, earning and spending, raising kids, advancing in careers in large numbers. It drives a boom. And as happened in Japan in the late 80s, ahead of the rest of the Western world, when they, kids leave the nest and they're saving for retirement, not, not just retirement, but saving for retirement, they stop spending. Right. Older people, you know, they downsize their homes. They don't drive. How, how far does an old person drive a car? 4,000 miles a year, maybe. Hang on, my God, this makes so much sense. So when I was sitting in school studying economics, if somebody had said to me, <laughs> economics is driven by, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a single guy, so he spends his money on this particular yeah. lifestyle. Then he gets married, so then he starts to, you know, and then he buys a, you know, a three-bedroom, four-bedroom house because he wants to have sure. a family. They buy two cars, they buy a van so they can have the kids. And then, you know, now they start saving for college. And, the, and, and so there's a, there's a whole cycle to someone's life. Right. Well, and it's something, particularly in the United States, there's one, one thing the United States government, that they measure what people spend every year in 600 categories. I, I'm not telling you when people spend, say, buy their first house, their second home, their first car, their second car. I can tell you when they eat the most potato chips, <laughs> age 42. Age 42 is no, no, the most what? potato chip Who, eating. Who's eating the potato chip? It's the kids, right? Yeah. Okay. Calorie intake peaks age 14. Average parent has the average kid age 28, 28 plus 14, 42. But the statistics said that potato chips go up to 42, then they go down the rest of their life. I could predict potato chips down in neighborhoods and in zip codes and regions anywhere in the world with that simple statistic because we know when people are born, we know they're going to be certain ages. It's like being a life insurance actor. You know, life insurance actor will tell you when, not when you're going to die, when the average person when the average will, die, will die. When the average person will die. 77.8 or something. Wow. Like a clock. I mean, they're predictive. So tell me about your background. How did, where did you grow up and, and what got you into, you know, this you know, interest of economics and... Yeah, that, that's the story. I did not set out to be an economist. I took my first three courses in college and said, well, this isn't for me. These people don't, never had sex, never run a business. They're trying to explain <laughs> consumer behavior and businesses. They, 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 they never agree, look at the same statistics. Nobody can understand them. Um, so I took business. You know, I took the finance and accounting yep. and, and undergrad, then I took uh, marketing and business strategy and all this stuff in, uh, uh, at Harvard Business School. Yep. And I was a business consultant, first to large companies for a number of years, and I couldn't stand that because I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur. I can't you know, look at something and it takes five years to make the change and get it down the hierarchy. So then I started consulting to entrepreneurs in new ventures in California in the early 80s, and that's when I really learned. Because wow. these new companies were growing by catering to the new young baby boomers back in the early days. They were starting all the new. Young people may cost a fortune. We'll show, we can show that they cause inflation because they're expensive. Yep. Uh, but they start new trends. 
So these companies were peeling them, so I started studying the baby boomers. Well, how many are there? Oh my gosh, there's a ton of these people, not just in the United States, but in Europe and Australia, every major country in the world, and started studying what they do. Oh my gosh, we know exactly when they spend. So there's a time, I've studied this for a year, but there was a time, and this is when I stopped being a business consultant and started being an economist, per se. 1988, I'm sitting at my desk, I have every chart from hell. You know, all types of trends, back as many years, decades, hundreds of years. I had this S&P 500 in the United States, stock index, adjusted for inflation on this side of this, and I just happened to have the birth index of the United States on this one. Right. And I'm like, that's the same chart? They look exactly like, put them, 45 to 50 year lag, boom, exact, almost exact match. Wow. And the light went off my head because I knew that the average person peaks in their spending at age 46, kind of plateaus to 50 and goes down. I'm like, that, that's right. I mean, I, you can predict the economy 50 years in advance with one simple indicator. And I'm like, holy smoke, I got to get out of business consulting and I got to get into economics. Now we've found, we have tons of other indicators. Yeah. Like I say, inflation, young people. Yeah. They're expensive. They, 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 they cost everything. They produce nothing. And that's what they're supposed to do. Not so take me to like uh, ec economics 101, inflation. Okay, inflation. Uh, in the past, people think government, monetary policies calls it, or you know, commodity prices and oil. Well, in, in, a, in a third world country, yes. Like just the printing of yeah, money. In major developed countries, oil prices are like 2-3% of the total economy in the United States, Europe, or Australia, and countries like that. All commodities that used to be the economy in the 1800s were like 10% max. It's, it's wages, and, 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 it, and it's the productivity of people. As, as people get older, they become better workers. They, they get higher salaries. They get paid more by companies because they're better. They're more experienced. So they actually bring inflation down. Young people cause inflation. In fact, we talked about a 46-year lag. We can see the economy. 46-year lag for peak and spending on the birth index in any major country. Inflation's a 20-year lag. You take the birth index in the United States, peaked 57 to 61, move that forward 20 years, you got a peaking inflation in the late 70s, very early 80s. Because that's when people enter the workforce, and now they're not an expense, they're not an investment, their productivity. They're going to end the work, they're going to work, they're going to earn money to spend, they're going to get married a few years later, 26, they're going to have kids, 28, 29, they're gonna, like you say, buy the house, 31, bigger house, 37, 40, I mean, I could go on and on. Wow. We know all these things. So there, we can predict all types of trends, real estate, cars, when they're going to save, when they're going to borrow. In the United States, and this is pretty much true, by the way, they have their lar highest mortgage and their highest debt when they buy their largest home. And why do they buy such a large home? Because their kids become teenagers and you, they want to be here and you want to yeah. be a thousand miles on the other side it's of the house. It's just common sense, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we, we tell people, and, and, and any economist would say, oh, you can't do this, impossible. No, you can see the key economic trends and cycles that are going to impact your life, your family, your business, and your investments over the rest of your lifetime today. Mm -hmm. Now, what we tell people with a caveat, what's difficult for us is the short term. Yeah. Economists think, well, short term, if you understand politics and monetary stuff. No. Short term, all types of things can happen. Geopolitical events and news events and, and random factors. In the long term, we said in our first book, Great Boom Ahead is the opposite of this title. 1992, the next Great Depression will occur from 2008 to 2023, and then a few paragraphs later, and no amount of government stimulus will stop it. And that's the big insight. When did today. you write that? 1992. The My Great God. Boom Ahead. And now, and now when, I, when we had that, all the best selling books in America, the, the, the Depression of the 1990s, Robbie Botcher, you know, The Great Reckoning, James Dale Davidson, uh, Conquer the Crash, Robert Prechter, you know, Bankruptcy 1995, Figgy. I mean, everybody said, the United States is over, Japan's taken over. And we said, well, wait a minute. No, Japan's going down. The United States is going to see the greatest boom in history, along with Europe. And it's just demographics. Mm. I don't know which president it is. Being Australian, this is like a second story, and you will probably be able to tell me who it was. But there's this, a story of a president saying to an economist, you know, what's going to happen? He said, well, on one hand, you know, this is going to happen. But on the other hand, and he said, well, what I need is just one, a one-handed economist. Yeah, I think that was Truman. Was Truman. That's right. Because economists look at the world like, well, if the government does this, or if the government does that, we said in our great, late 2008, we're going to see the first downturn. Things have peaked. There's a major banking crisis, and we can talk about that too. That's massive. The government's going to stimulate. They're predictable too, because they react. They're yeah. going to stimulate strongly, and guess what? 
About a year later, it is going to fail. Wow. Stock market rally is going to go back towards 11,000. We said right in the book. And then it's going to fail. And then the economy is going to bounce back. Real estate is going to seem to come back. And it's going to fail because they have not solved this banking crisis. They've only pushed it off. All they did was pour some coffee. Baby boomers have peaked. As, they, as the last generation did from 68 to 82, and note, note the stocks go up about 26 years, then down 14. Every 39, 40 years, you'd think somebody would figure this out. Well, Stock market has. 29, 68, is, is, 2000, is actually 39 years. someone that's figured it out, years. it's here, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, really, uh, people say, uh, complex, and all this. no. The reason I figured out, because I wasn't an economist. Economist. I was working in real business with the people driving it, real entrepreneurs to the generation yeah. who was driving it. And I just happened to trip on demographics. I was yeah. always into cycles, but I tripped yeah. on the demographics right at the right time. So, you know, I think any, any entrepreneur will admit in retrospect, yeah, I had a vision, but, you know, I've never seen anybody's vision from the beginning, right? You experiment, you're, you're serious, you look at something, and the truth will come out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it will come in a different way than you think. I wasn't trying to predict the economy back then, but my consulting just let... Next thing I know, I get these two charts come together. That was just the beginning. I'm like, aha, yeah, this wow. is incredible. I, did, I didn't think this was possible either. Yeah. Next thing, a year later, I got a whole, we can predict inflation 20 years in advance. And you know, guess what? Everybody says government stimulus can cause inflation. Deflation is the trend. We are 100% clear on that. We're going to see deflation in prices around the world, particularly in developed countries, for the first time since the 1930s. Nobody's seen Deflation in the first time since 1930s. Prices go down. Do you, what's the rate? Well, yeah, probably 10, 20%. 10, 20%. Prices go down. Per, like per annum, compounding on? Well, or? in total. You know, right. prices, just the price of everything. All types of things drop. Now, what we've already seen in real estate, United States, yeah. down 30 to 40%. Unless you're in Vegas, Ryan which is like Florida down 50 Florida and Vegas is <laughs> down 50% <laughs> yeah. plus. We think it's going to go down 70% or more. Yeah. Uh, another less 70% week, in Vegas. 70%, yeah. Wow. Uh, I have been renting a home in Tampa, Florida for, for a number of years now. We, we, we followed our advice in our newsletter. We said, look, 2005, this thing is topping. This is a bubble just like Japan yep. before it. And the things we've learned in history, and, and it's crystal clear if you look at it, Every major bubble, you cannot stop a bubble once it's gone extreme. It will deflate, and it will go at least back to where it started. Now, if you're in the United States, that means home prices got to get back to where they were in 2000. Well, that's not that long ago. Home prices doubled in five years. Yeah. Worse in Australia. Yeah. Um, worse in Spain. And, and so this housing thing is going to take years. And uh, the flip side of it, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're somebody that sees this, this is going to be the greatest bargains in real estate. We've seen that the young generation coming out is going to go back and see affordable housing. I mean, yeah. in California, a starter home not too many years ago, $800,000. That is nuts. Yeah. That's not the American dream. Yeah. Or a one bed, where I live, uh, a one-bedroom apartment goes for about six or 700000 Yeah. You know, it's like... That's right. Uh, well, it's funny. I was in Australia in August, and we were doing a tour with Laura Langmire and Mark Victor Hansen and some I other know. people. And... The thing I had to deal with in Australia, people, you know, say stocks go up and down, and, and we, our book did very well in Australia. The, the Great Boom Ahead came out there and other books, the Roaring 2000s and stuff. But when I was there, yeah, they could believe the economy could go down, they could believe stocks could go down. They could not believe real estate could go down. I said, look, it already happened in Japan. 1991, J Japanese house prices are down 63% of the top. They're still down 63%. United States, look what's happened there. Australia's economy's held up better. They've got China next door. There's commodity thing. You know, they've got some things. But the difference in a place like Australia, everybody lives in an expensive coastal city. In the United mm. States and a lot of parts of Europe, a lot of people are inland in affordable areas. Yeah. Dallas, Texas didn't bubble. Yeah. Miami, Florida, and Las bubbled. Vegas, and yep. New York, and California did. Yep. So places I, I, you know, I was telling Australia, you are lucky in Australia because you can still sell near at the top. Mm. People in America, if they sold a day, are already down 30 40%. They're still going to save a lot more. Mm. The part that I've been lately having a really hard time getting my head around uh, with money is, <laughs> you know, I sort of tried to, to layer it back to, well, what was money? You know, it's like if I, you know, if we were both living in a, in a village and, and I did something and, and on your behalf and you said to me, oh, well, you know, I'll give you, you know, half my cow when I, you know, go to, go to slaughter. And then I want to call in that debt now, but you don't want to, you know, you want to wait another six months. So you kind of write an IOU and then I could maybe trade that IOU off to somebody else. And, and then sort of like the, 
the concept of money. That it was backed by, a, you know, in this case, a, a cow. But it, it, do you want to give me the history, the history of money, and where it's at now, and the the fiat currency that we have, and the printing of it with no with no value behind it? Well, you know, the simplest money is a means of exchange. Uh -huh. Barter is very inefficient. I, I, hey, if I want a chicken, do I have to like, what am I going to give him, a cow? I mean, yeah. I, I, it's very difficult. So money is that, and money started, money has always grown with the economy, whether it's gold coins, and if they run out of them, they clip them in half and they change the valuation. It, it, it can be shells in some uh, ancient civilization. So I remember just at Club Med, they had, um, they had these necklaces and you would like pull apart yeah. and buy drinks over the bar. Exactly. With, I remember as a kid, I loved it. It was like the idea of having this thing that you wore and then, but yeah, so money is just a sense so of trade. It means of exchange, it has to be trusted. And so if something's gold, yeah. that makes it more trustable. But the truth is there's not enough gold to, to fuel the money supply in the world. And people say you gotta go back to the gold standard. It's just not possible. The thing that people don't understand, and actually my favorite economist in the world is Steve Keen from Australia. He explains it better. Economists say, oh, it's, it's money supply, and Milton Friedman said it's money supply. The money supply that governments create is nothing. There's like maybe two trillion in actual money created by the Federal Reserve in the United States. Not quite that. And they doubled it in the last year. And people say, they doubled it? That's going to cause inflation. Steve Keen shows it's a creation of price, those IOUs you talked about. A bank takes a deposit lends it 10 times over with a 10% like reserve thing. They only have to keep 10% of that as a reserve against loss and stuff. Because this thing, they if I if I money 10 times, press the boom. There's four, in the United States, for example, you take the, 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 the basic money is about $2 trillion circulate. Private credit, not government debt, private credit created by banks, $42 trillion. What's a trillion or two in money supply? It's the creation of private credit that causes bubbles. Yeah. It's normal for credit to grow a little faster and a boom, baby boomers. We've said, hey, baby boomers are going to spend more and borrow more up to a point. But when banks extend too much credit and make it too easy and then the government's lower interest rates to stimulate the economy, it can get out of control and you get bubbles. So and so that's basically this yeah. global financial crisis is what yeah. you've described, correct? Global, yeah, because yeah. banks, a number of things happen. Banks lent massively against real estate that doubled typically in five years. Now, now let, let's say I bought a Ferrari from Italy. It's the latest model, and there was a labor strike, and they were scarce, and all of a sudden the price doubled. Would a bank lend me double against that? Not in a million years. But real estate, real estate never goes down. Mm. We looked at history. Real estate goes up and down like a yo-yo. It hasn't gone down in our lifetimes because this baby boom generation everywhere has driven everything up, up, up. But we've been warning for you, they're going to peak in real estate. Real estate bubbled. Banks lent against that. They didn't just lend against it in the United States. They lent it with no money down. And then, oh, and, and we don't want to pay interest. You're not going to be able to afford a big house if you pay interest. So you don't pay any interest for five or ten years. And then we'll, let the, that, we'll put that in the rising cost, and you'll pay that later because the house is going to go up and it'll be okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to go into this too far. We've looked at this. What the banks did here was the craziest thing. And this is the United States. It wasn't as bad as in Australia. It wasn't as bad as most European countries or Canada. It was bad in Spain, Great Britain, Ireland. But the United States took the cake. So we have started a bubble. All this money comes up. And then they say, oh, that's not enough. We're going to lend all these crazy loans. But to keep getting more money to feed this monster, we're going to put them in securities, package them together. Oh, they're diversified. We wrapped them up. Red paper, little perfume. And here's the catch. In we'll insure them. Not just the diversified mortgages and housing never goes down. We're going to insure them by companies like AIG. The trouble is most insurance, you have to have collateral. Yeah. No, not. Oh. This was unregulated. AIG just said, we'll cover it. Credit wow. default swaps. I don't want to get in that. So not so only it's a derivative yeah. of a derivative of a yeah, derivative it, it, of a derivative. A trillion of this stuff on top of this private credit. It, it, it is such a mess you can't believe it. This is way beyond what happened in the Roaring Twenties before that bubble burst and we had the Great Depression. Beyond what happened in Japan in the eighties, we predict that late eighties we said their bubble real estate economy is going to burst and they're going to be down twelve. What do you do when you years. predict something in like you know how many years later does it take for the fruition to have it, like in that case? That's my biggest challenge in books. Okay, great boom ahead, late 90, 92, we come out, and we're saying by, by 94, 95, this thing's dead. Well, we had to wait two to three years to be clearly proven right. So and you get then to do your happy dance. Yeah, I was going to say, you get to do yeah, your happy dance. Yeah. yeah. It's like I, I tell everyone now, I write it now, three years later, everyone's now, oh my God, he's a genius, he's right. And then you get to do the happy dance. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so that's my challenge. I mean, we, people need to hear this now. I yeah. mean, we came out late 2008. It was well, actually January 2009 with this hardback. And we sold like crazy the first few months. Why? The stock market was crashing. Mm. People say, crashing? I better read the Great Depression ad. <laughs> we predicted in the book there'd be this rebound. But no, no, people aren't interested now. This thing is going to crash again. It is yeah. gonna, you're going to see a crash probably as big. Uh, this housing thing, this whole credit bubble in housing, whether, you know, the, the reason these, it wasn't just housing melting down and loans going down and banks get in trouble. All types of investment managers and pension funds bought these mortgage securities yep. and then a lot of people bought them on le and leveraged that. And leveraged this, and leveraged. this thing is so sinister. The way I described it to a friend of mine the other day, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, was I said, it, the way I see it is kind of like, I have this credit card bill and I can't pay it. <laughs> and then I open up a letter and it says like Visa wants to give you a you know credit limit of ten thousand dollars and you've got a you know like a, an American Express and it's like oh yeah I'll sign up and now so now like I was in I was in cash flow problems because I'd, I've maxed out my credit card and I can't meet the repayment but then the next credit card's come in and so and it they looks, give you a teaser at first yeah yeah it's like in. one oh yeah and move the move the debt over and, and it'll be one percent and you're like and so to you know it looks like I'm back in cash flow it looks like the cash is flowing again and but what happens when I hit that that, that um, what do you call it, uh, the credit limit on yeah, that right. one. Is that what you're saying? Uh, is that a good metaphor or am well, I wrong? Well, it's also similar. These credit card loans are defaulting like crazy, just like mortgages are defaulting because they were bad loans. They yeah. didn't look at credit. And the, the credit cards then turn around and say, okay, now that we got you, we're going to raise your interest rate to make up for our losses. Well, how are you ever going to pay this thing yeah. off now that they raised it to 22% and then 33% in some cases? So, Do you have kids? I have three stepkids. Yeah. Do you do? You, what's your advice to them on, on borrowing? Like, well, is it like delayed gratification? To them, number one, they're they like, oh, houses come down, time to buy. Don't buy it. My my kids are like their twenties and early thirties. Yeah. Don't buy yet. You're going to be the biggest beneficiary of this now. And don't borrow money. Generate cash flow from your business, your job. Keep your job. Do anything you can to generate money, entrepreneurial and business, uh, and. And wait for housing to go down further. That's, you're going to buy a house much cheaper, which raises your standard of living right there with your same job. And then wait a long, at some point, you're going to be able to refinance at even lower mortgage rates. Deflation ultimately means lower prices of real estate, goods, and mortgage rates. So, so think of that $800,000 starter home in California that in about 2012 or 13, and we're very clear about that, that we finally get kind of a bottom. And you can buy that home for three hundred thousand dollars, and you can finance it at three to four percent wow. mortgage. What does that done to your standard living? So, so people say depression is depressing. No, if you see it coming, and for the younger generation, and for the businesses that survive, and the entrepreneurial companies that are flexible and move with this, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. But you I, have to see it coming. I remember seeing a, it was a movie, and it kind of been a very memorable movie. But what? But because <laughs> I don't remember the name of it. But in it, the 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 character went back um, in time by like two days. Oh, was it two Groundhog days? Day or no, 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 yeah, Groundhog <laughs> <laughs> Punks <laughs> Tony Phil. No, um, it was, uh, but in this, it, what happened was he was able to see like what a, ho a horse won. You know, he could see what stock uh, rose. And so he was just able to go back two days and then go, you know, like, oh, okay, this has happened. And then, and then he would go back into the future and was able, and he was just, just amassing this huge amount of money. Um, hmm. That image comes to mind. It seems to me like the, the, what, you've talk, what you're talking about is when those two um, graphs yeah. lined up for you, it's almost like you got the crystal ball and went, oh, I know, you know, I'll rent. You know, because a lot of people have this ego of like, well, I own my own house. Yeah. And my business partner is a very wealthy um, uh, uh, man. He's, he's in his 80s. He says, number one, he's like, number one, you don't ever own your house. You still have rates to pay. Rates is, a, is, a, is like a rent yeah. that you pay to the government. So number one, just lose the illusion that you ever own this thing. It's, it, it's bullshit. Can, I can say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> the second, you know, and then the second thing is, is that, um, uh, is that uh, what you're, the, the, the cost versus the actual return on investment isn't worth it. You should be renting. But then I have all these friends that are out like, oh, I've bought a place and I'm buying a place. And, I'm, and, I'm th you know, and it's hard because there's a part of you thinking, oh, maybe I should be buying a place. But everything economically really does point to housing prices are going to come down. Yeah, they've come down a lot. Uh, in some places, they've got a lot more to come. Some places, little. I mean, I'd rather buy, actually, in Miami right now than New York City because Miami has gone down more and they're both going to go down a lot. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, 
it, it goes up. I mean, there was in, in uh, I don't know, 50 years ago, maybe, maybe half the people at most bought a house, they had put 50% down. No, no, so it was a whole different thing. Housing's become very affordable. Lending's become extremely accommodative, particularly in the last 10, 20 years. And so it just meant a bigger bubble. We didn't have this big a housing bubble in the roaring 20s. Uh, this, but, now, but Japan had a great one in the 80s. So you just have to keep in perspective. I mean, we tell people things are way more predictable than you think. There was a time, I'm sure if you go back zillions of years, where people didn't get the connection between having sex and a baby popping out nine months later. I mean, literally, I bet that took eons in human evolution to figure out. I, there was a time when people didn't know that winter came exactly 12. I mean, figuring that out in modern civilization was a huge thing. So economists say- You make a point. I hadn't thought of it like that. But, <laughs> but we learn. Yeah. So, so people say, well, actually, here's what I get. I say you can predict things over the rest of your lifetime. People say, what are you saying? Things are changing faster. Technology to change faster. Globalization. Things are getting more complex. I said, no, you're missing it. We have so much more information now than we had just 20 years ago, 50 years, 100 years. In fact, we only can measure statistics most in the last century. You know, yeah. the information makes it. And, and like Brad was saying, I mean, that stomper net and comes like, you can start a business now. You can get information. I even woke up. I'm, I'm not that tech savvy. I used to have my secret. Can you find this? And I'm like, I just Googled it. Oh yeah. my gosh, it appears. <laughs> like, oh, that's how I found Steve Keen in Australia. I was going to Australia, give yeah. a talk, I, I, and, and I, I wanted to find some background. Steve Keen, I'm like, oh my God, I just found the greatest economist in the world on Google. Wow. So that's what makes a difference. But I couldn't have done this before I, for the um, late 80s when I found it. There wasn't enough information. But that's what I was going to say is you've got these two graphs side by side. What's the, what's the first graph? S&P 500 S &P adjusted 500, for inflation, which means it's real. For inflation. And then you've got the, the birth index the birth in the United index. States. And they match up, but you can't see the rise of Google. You can't see, you can't see. We have an indicator for that too. Oh really? Called the S curve. Okay, explain. Now the S curve is another <laughs> predictive thing. And again, we're saying, look, it's people that drive trends. Yes. People grow up and earn, spend money in modern common. Now, I wouldn't use this in Uganda, because mm -hmm. the average person doesn't go up this steep curve they do in Australia or Europe, the United States or Japan, and increasingly yep. China. But the S curve says that in an entrepreneurial process, it's very hard to get that first customer. Yep. And then it's, it goes fast, but then at the 10th and the 100th, it takes the same time to go from commercialization, let's say the first few, 0.1% to 10%. That's a niche market. For automobiles, that took 14 years. And it took 14 years before that to go through invention, but let's, 14 years to get to 10%. Then it went from 10 to 90, 1914 to 20, and 14 years, ten, nine times the progress. So the S-curve says that once consumers start adopting something, how fast they adopt it in the first s segments will tell you how fast that product will move through society for the rest of the cycle. Mm. I learned at Harvard Business School, one of the few things I learned there, because I've learned much more from my entrepreneurial pursuits than I ever did in school, and the smartest people always do. I'm guessing you're not going to be invited to do the commencement speech. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Is that <laughs> all products, all technologies and business go through a four-stage cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we know in four stages? Everything. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Well, let's go back to inflation. You want to understand inflation? Inflation's summer. Inflation's like temperatures. The temperature is the highest August, something like that in the United States, and they're the lowest in winter. Summer was the late 60s, 70s, early 80s. High temperatures, inflation, economy doesn't like that. You come from inflation, it comes down. Productivity, new generation, new technology. Brings temperatures down, a nice, wonderful temperature. Fall, everybody loves fall. What follows fall? Winter. winter. Economists are saying we're going to go back to inflation. I could have told, we not only predicted in 1992 that we'd see a downturn, we said it'd be a depression, it'd be deflationary, because that's winter. So again, we're not surprised in November, December, like in the United States here, where it all of a sudden starts getting cold. Now, it may get cold a little earlier, a little later, it may be a little colder or not, so we can't predict it perfectly, but we, we told people, hey, here's where we're going, this stage, you have to have a different business strategy for every stage, a different investment strategy. What, what do most stockbrokers tell you? Oh, just do asset allocation, be in these four categories. No, that's not going to work in winter. Everything falls in winter. Commodities are going down, right? right. Real estate's going down. Right? Stocks are going down. Yep. In Asia, in Europe, in the United States, small company, large company, it's all going down. We've been warning people of this 
for two decades. So what do you do? When That's it's winter. Going, it what is freezes it? and makes ways for. What do you spring. do when it's going down? Do you get out and go into gold? Do you get out and go into cash? Do you? It, you what's the? What's the asset protection strategy? Well, again, it's one thing where for investors, it depends on your risk tolerance. Our, our, in our newsletter right now, we're telling people the basic play, because there's a lot more things, but to make it simple. Hang on, so, um, just so we understand, newsletter comes out once a month. Yeah, once a month, and we have month. up to daily updates, email, okay. and messages. And where do I find that? Uh, hsdent.com. Hsdent.com. That's our website. Okay, hsdent.com. Um, that you, uh, what were we talking about? We were talking about... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, your strategies. What do you do? Yeah. We're saying the simplest play is you bet against the stock market. We had this big crash, now we've had this big rally. And I'll tell you right now, if I knew nothing else, this is not a rally. This is not a new bull Did market. Did you know the rally was going to come? Or yeah. is that surprised you? We said you? it in our book. No, no. Oh we God. said in late 2008, <laughs> we're going to see this first big downturn. The yep. government is going to do what they predicted to do. We're going to save you. We're Superman. Big stimulus. Big rebound in stocks and economy, and then it's going to fail. Yeah. Because baby boomers aren't going to spend no matter what you do. People in their 50s don't drive cars anymore. Yep. They downsize their houses. They don't have to put their, feed their kids, put them through college. They're not going to spend. You give them money, they'll just save it. Yeah. So, and... But then when they save it, doesn't that then go into a bank that then has the ability to lend 10 times yeah, that? But so they're not lending because oh, right. credits collapsed. They, they, they saturated businesses, and particularly consumers and real estate with loans. Yep. The banks are on their backs. So if the government hadn't bailed them out, they'd have been dead. dead. We say they are dead. Yep. They died, not in 2008 or nine. They died in 2005 when they lent aggressively against real estate that yep. doubled in five yep. years. They're already dead. Yeah. So over time, that'll prove out. So you get these baby boom generations slows down. You get this deleveraging of $42, tri 42 trillion dollars in private credit. Oh my God. And that is deflationary. Yeah. That's winter. Yeah. And it's good. Uh, another thing we find that in this like little seasonal, this four season thing, people, economists say bubbles are bad. No, bubbles financed all these entrepreneurial companies you may end up with only a few Googles and Stomper Nets, but that's huge. Yeah. These are the General Motors of the future. Yeah. People, we tell people it wasn't in the Roaring Twenties. All these companies were growing from innovation early in the Roaring Twenties. The leaders that we see now, General Motors or General Electric, who are now having troubles because they're in their later days, they were made in the Great Depression because all their competition fell down in the shake. Bubbles allow massive innovation and new business models because everybody could get equity. Just 10 years ago, late 90s, any company with a good idea yeah. could get funding. Yeah. Now nobody can get funding. Yeah. Bubbles up, and then when you finally hit this deleveraging and this downturn, very quickly you weed down to the companies. We tell a lot of entrepreneurial companies, all you have to do is survive the next yes. few years. You're not going to have any competition. You're going to inherit yeah. the yeah. world like General yeah. Motors did in the early 30s. Yeah. So again, if you understand it, you'll know what to do. Investors need to be betting against stocks. You can short the stock market. Yeah. There's an index called SH. It's just the inverse of the S&P 500. You know how much we think that's going to fall? We think, well, let's put in Dow terms. Dow goes up to, say, 11,300 in the next few months and then falls to two to 5,000. My best guess would be 3,500 to 4,000. That's a 67% gain, and that's going to happen between, let's say, March or April and maybe October. Less than a year, 67%. That's for an aggressive investor. A moderate, uh, a very Sorry, and that's by shorting the stock. Short betting the yep. stock will go down because you can bet almost anything will go down. Yeah. A so really Australia conservative investor, a, an older person, retirement, and already lost money, and oh my God, just be in cash. Yeah. Maybe make one percent in treasury bills. You holding cash, you think you're not making anything. Real estate, stocks, business, everything, even chicken, oil prices all fall, and now your cash is worth more. Yeah. In between, everybody, the dollar's gone down, down, down. The dollar's going to go up. We, the dollar got debased, fiat currency, by all this credit being created, 42 trillion in the United States. And now that credit's deleveraging, we're destroying credit in dollars, and the dollar will actually go back up. We, the dollar's already down 60% since Ronald Reagan and 40% since 2000. I know, I'm loving it. Like, uh, was it nine months ago I was here, and I was, I think, buying the U.S. dollar at, you know, um, uh, one Australian dollar was getting me 60 US cents. Mm -hmm. and I was now, in Australia one time, 45 cents. A and now I think I'm doing 92. I haven't yeah. looked. That's in the 92 last would be about right. 92. Right 
That's great. For See, me, I'm sorry. If I was an Australian it, yeah. or Canadian yeah. or somebody in Euros, yeah. I would want to cash those in and be in U.S. dollars. Yeah. In, in the U.S., a moderate investor, if this, let's say we're right, the stock market goes down 50 to 70%. That's a huge play. If you want less risk, maybe 5% downside, the U.S. dollar, the last time stocks crashed, May of 08 to March of 09, it went up 20%. Mm. So a lot of very smart people who were predicting the banking crisis was going to occur had their clients long gold, short dollar, and they lost money even though they're right. Because that's the difference between winter and summer, yep. inflation and deflation. Deflation does not favor gold. Gold's going up now. We've been telling people, we just told people recently, like, sell gold here. All right. We've been saying, keep it for a while in the early stage of the crisis, but ultimately, gold's going to go down. Yep. So gold is not the way to protect yourself. Cash, U.S. dollar, because almost every other currency's gone up and the dollar's gone down, and betting against real estate if you can, betting against stocks, anywhere. China's going to have a bigger crash. Sorry, excuse my ignorance. How do you bet against real estate? Uh, I, there, there are now indexes, I think Kay Schiller came out with some, that follow the top 20 cities in the United States, for example. All right. Uh, so, and, and he, he, they came up with that so, so people could hedge against real estate. Wow. Now, that's harder. Also, real estate's already taken a huge fall, and stocks have gone way back up. The best play, we, best single play, is to be short stocks. And, and if there's a way, which I'm not, I'd have to look it up, there's a way to short China, that's going to be an even bigger one. And, and we're bullish on China after this, but they are levered up. They're dependent, 35% of their economy exports to the Western world and stuff. They have bubbled up and stimulated so much stuff, they're going to take a huge fall temporarily. Yeah. I'm just looking forward to reading this cover to cover about three or four times. It would appear to me that um, that there's been a lot of misinformation out there. What, how, why is there misinformation? I mean, these economists clearly can't... I mean, they're not idiots, but, no, but they've well, been they're saying... definitely not idiots. Economists are very intelligent. Yeah. And they do a lot of very diligent research. The thing is, it's what I call the club thing. Economists go to Yale, and they, go, and they all believe certain theories. They all got educated a certain way, and they believe certain stuff. And then when somebody like me comes on, just like I mean, I mean, Bill Gates said, when the Internet came along, oh, it's not going to last. Yeah. Bill Gates! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the big founders yeah. of the information <laughs> revolution. Nobody wants the established companies and the established don't want some new point of view to be right because it, it kind of messes with their old point of view and they're happy with it. They all agree on it. They all sit at the bar at Yale and the Yale Club and have their cognacs and yes, yeah. It, it's just that simple, you know. Yeah. And so the new way has to prove itself. And, 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 and you know, like Peter Drucker said, you have to be ten times as good yeah. to have an entrepreneurial concept that can overtake the, the momentum yes. of the oldest. These companies are a trillion times your size. So how long have you been doing this for? Uh, we, I've been actually, my newsletter started in 89. My first book, self-published, was all in 89. So I, and I came up with that first model, yeah. that, that spending wave, this 46-year leg on birth in 1988. 1988. So you've had you've had that time where you've had 20 some. Years. So all of a sudden, like 90 percent of the people in the in the population are going to hear about you, given your that model. No, that, that's no. still the way. I tell you, <laughs> we we're still talking to like more than like the one to five percent. I mean, yeah. I've sold well over a million books. Yeah. That's nothing. I mean, there's yeah. 300 million people in the United States yeah. uh, alone, where we sell most of our books. We sell around, but. No, we're still early stage. This yeah. is not something I, I entrepreneurial business uh, owners and, and, and uh, independent financial advisors and, and high net worth people are our biggest clientele. And when we survey our newsletter and who buys our book, that's what we find. It's, it's not anywhere near mainstream. Yeah. Susie Orman's at mainstream because yeah. she's telling people how to get out of debt and pay down the credit card. Yes. That's a mainstream concept yes. and should be and she's very good at it. Yeah. I mean, it's not this or that, it's both. I mean, that would make sense to do what Susie Orman's suggesting, but to also be aware of what it is that you're predicting. Um, do you have any last-minute predictions that you want to let the audience know? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, we think that we've been saying this bounce would happen, but we don't think the stock market rally is over quite yet because mm -hmm. we have short-term indicators as well and say and we're looking at the dumb money and the smart money yeah and <laughs> like the that. smart money is not selling into this yet they're going to sell in this a few months before it turns over so we're we're thinking the stock market peaks again eleven thousand three hundred or so on the dow maybe a little higher maybe somewhere between february and march april at the latest big crash i mean i'm talking six seven eight thousand points in dow into late 2010 
Real estate, we tell people, you've got a little more time. This, uh, real estate's kind of coming back, getting a little better. That it'll, you, you probably, if you're in the, like, in the United States, or most developed places, and, and you probably have six months, well through the spring season before you need to sell real estate. And we tell people, look, most people didn't listen to us before about real estate. But now they know it can go down. And now it's getting a little better. If you wish you had sold something, do it by the summer, you know, by the late spring of 2010. And we don't think real estate will start to bottom till 2012, 13, and, and then commercials later. So, I mean, we have, I mean, I could, we have a lot of predictions in the book. We look at all the major countries in the world. And, and an, another thing we get is, oh, well, China, China, China. Yeah, yeah, China's going to grow, but more urbanization. China stopped having children in the early 70s on a 46-year lag. They run out of demographic growth literally in five, six, seven years. Mm the growth story in the world outside of the slowing of Europe and then the kind of plateauing of the United States is India. Many other countries too, but India is the one large country that is very low urbanization. Urbanization alone is a huge growth engine and we can predict things on that alone. And they've got demographic trends up for 60 years before they peak. Wow, 60 years so before they So for foreign peak. investors and for entrepreneurs and, and businesses that want to invest in the world, because we're also saying, Look, all the Western countries, Japan was just the first and ahead, are going to go through this, oh my gosh, we don't have a generation to follow this one that's bigger. They're smaller and smaller. Nobody's having kids. The United States and Australia at least have very strong immigration, and even that's not going to last in the United States. Immigration is going to go right down the tubes in this downturn. So the Western world is slowing, I mean, as far as the eye can see. It's the emerging world that's going to count for most of the growth when we come out of this downturn. And in India, increasingly from the 2020s on, is going to absolutely dominate that growth. Mm -hmm. So we, we look around the world and the United States, we look at where people are moving. And certain states are still growing even in this downturn. Mm -hmm. People are moving there. I think it's very challenging for the average uh, way Jonah, the average person mm -hmm. that has dedicated themselves to a career. To, with, under the concept of I do a hard day's work, I get paid, I buy a house, I pay off the mortgage, you know, the government is there to look out, you know, to help support me. And I think this great big veil has been unlifted from people now, where they're realizing that, you know, like you said before, dumb money and smart yeah. money, that there really, it, there is no excuse now for like, oh, it's not fair. It's like, well, you, the information's out there. You can Google it. You can find yeah. it. So there really is just going to be a massive shift in, in people being aware of where the money is, what the changes are in the economy. But, but moving out of the, oh, I pay down my, my house, I pay off my credit cards. It seems to me that really the whole population really needs to shift to actually understanding what's going on. I mean, it's almost, like, right. it's, like, it's almost like building a house on the Titanic in the sense of you, you would want to know whether this boat's going to be floating. You want to know what, which exactly. boat is better. The, there's a lot of research, but very few people put the time and effort into it. Do you, do you have a theory as to why that is? Well, again, it, it's the S-curve. The, the, the more entrepreneurial people or risk takers will do something earlier. And you know the, the why? Because it's more risky then. Mm. Automobiles were terribly hard to drive in the early 1900s, and computers were terribly, PCs were terribly hard to learn when Apple came out with them and then the first Microsoft systems. People who start first get more gains. They get in earlier. The businesses start earlier. They, they get... Uh, you know, much more growth and a much stronger position long term. And in fact, when we look at emerging countries in the world, people think China is, you know, they're smarter than Americans and they're richer. No, they're not. They're not even close. Hmm. 5,000 per capita income. Brazil, big country, a lot of growth demographic. 8,000 per capita income. They're already 80% urban. They're more urban than the United States and they're not even a fraction. Why? Great Britain did the Industrial Revolution first. America led the Information Revolution. You get gains in that for decades to follow. So it's the same in business, same with consumers. The people who want to wait until something's proven and all their neighbors have done it and, and, it's, and real estate's gone up forever, so never, they're the ones that get the least gains and get hurt the most when the bubble bursts or when the trend goes down. So if you want to get ahead of things, you're going to have to be a little leading. You have to take a little more risk. You're gonna, you have to stop listening to the mainstream, mm. the dumb money, the economists, <laughs> or, or anybody in the industry yep. who's mainstream, been around forever. And, and I hate to say it. I mean, mo mo the average person, who do you think they listen to in the United States? Warren Buffett. He's never said he was an economist. No. He's such a great investor. All he does is buy. He says, I don't know what the economies do. I don't care. I just buy good company. 
the average American now, they'll ask him questions about economy and they'll say, well, I think the Fed's doing right. They're listening to him. He doesn't even pretend. Mm. He doesn't even care about the economy. Mm. And they're listening to him. Well, he's a long-term buy and hold. Yeah. He buys yeah. it. He exactly. never sells. He's like, if it's making a dollar, I'm not But this sell is going to be a long-term yeah, downturn. Yeah, 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 yeah. 1929, the stock market peaked. You know how long it took to get back to those levels? 24 years. 24 years. 1953. Peaked in 68. Mm. 25 years to get back to those levels. Wow. It, so that's the thing about these seasons. The economy's up most of the time. Winter is a long down, and you mm. can't just buy and hold mm. in winter. And, and even though housing may bottom by 2012 or 13, it's not going to come roaring back. Yeah. If you're a real estate investor, you want to buy housing cheap, reposition it to the right demographic, which means younger people, the next generation. You want to refinance it cheap, and you want to manage it for cash flow. People have been playing real estate in the last decade as appreciation. I buy it, I don't care what it costs, I don't care the loan, I don't, the banks don't care the credit, because it's going to go up. It's not going to go up, and it's not going to come roaring back anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole different environment. If you want to be ahead of it, you have to think, you have to be a little more, you have to say, look, who are the new people coming out that make sense? And let's talk to the people who are doing things earlier. If you look at what most people are listening to on the news, you're going to miss it. I'm yep. sorry. And I'm out there, I've been out there 20 years, most people don't know what we're saying. Yeah, that's crazy. And later they figured out and say, oh, well, that was great. Well, how can I help you when, it's, when the economy's already mm -hmm. down and your house's already down and you've been thrown out of your house and your credit card's bust and your, your, you know, your retirement plan's worthless? How can I help you now? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I would absolutely love to, um, I would absolutely love to spend like until 3 a.m. talking <laughs> to you. Unfortunately, um, I'm getting the wrap up. Um, there is, uh, so the, the recommendation is this would be the best place to start. Yes. I mean, this book ahead. is comprehensive. To tell you the truth, just read chapter one. I just mean, read chapter, chapter one. one <laughs> I mean, if you get that far, you're way ahead of most people. Right. Because most people who buy books don't even read past the first chapter two. So I've learned to put the most important stuff in yeah. chapter one. So most important stuff in chapter one. And then, and now my understanding is that, because I, uh, when I went to harrydent.com, um, today you actually have sorry so the hsdent.com is where we find the newsletter yeah and, and, and again we have all types of information you can go on that website and learn types of stuff we got a global data I mean so I mean but you'd recommend start here like yeah. buy the book yeah. read you that you need to understand yeah. the point of view first then the next resource is hsdent and then what is uh, the harrydent.com there was a there's like a training program or something like that yeah that I mean we have a day in the United States we have a day and a half program that is just in a day and a half well, we've had business people particularly entrepreneurs change their entire strategy with no consulting just from what we've run, yeah. they understand the escrow, and then they're, oh my gosh, it becomes clear what they need to do. Investors, the same thing. Because you have to get immersed. We tell people, when every time I watch the news and hear stuff, I, I, the news says this is the reason, I think, oh no, it's just demographics. Yeah. If you think demographics, a lot of this stuff will be clear. So, Harry, yeah, get an you've education. Got, you've got so much information. I, and um, I think we have a, a, a little clip um, that uh, explains HS Dent and some of the things that um, people can uh, actually learn from. Um, from your site, I, I seriously, you're, my brain is fried. To be honest with you, like I just realized that I thought I knew a little bit, <laughs> and I realized I know nothing in in the area of um, economics. And thank you so much for educating me. And it was great to have you okay. on the show. Thank Thanks. you very Enjoy much. It. Thank you. <laughs> this is not going to be, as you can already see, an ordinary recession. It's going to be deeper and last longer. Do you want the truth about today's economy and position yourself to prosper in the most exciting period of economic opportunity to come along in 80 years? We are HS Dent, an independent economic research company owned by renowned economic forecaster Harry S. Dent Jr. When no one else did, Harry Dent successfully predicted the shocking 1990 collapse of the Japanese market the extraordinary U.S. economic boom of the 90s and early 2000s, and the devastating global recession that began in 2008. If you'd like to learn what's coming next, when, and what you can do to prepare for it, then you need to get Harry's new How to Prosper in a Downturn, Your Path to Economic Success and Fulfillment. In this audio collection, Dent presents his contrarian, often shocking economic forecasts and predictions for the next 10 years and beyond he then offers specific tactics and strategies that you can use to protect your wealth, assets, and business right now.
You can try to make sense of what's said in the news and the papers, or you can get How to Prosper in a Downturn and start learning and applying dense methods today. With How to Prosper in a Downturn, you can begin growing and rebuilding your portfolio and make it stronger than ever in the new economic era to come.